20 years ago, three years after graduating as a dentist, I attempted to take my life. It was a long-term solution to a short-term problem, a therapist would tell me years later. They were right. Thankfully, I didn't succeed in the short-term problem, the severe distress in which the only way out was to take my life, well, that passed. It would return many times again, the feeling that the only way to escape unbearable emotional pain was to end my life. My suicide attempt didn't come from nowhere. Bizarrely, perhaps, I didn't realize I was depressed or that I'd had severe anxiety until the day before my attempt, I looked in the telephone book for a psychotherapist. And yet, with hindsight, I had clearly been having shorter or longer bouts of feeling hopeless for many years. In the 20 years since the suicide attempt, I have come to learn more about my fluctuating state of well-being. I accept it as a part of me, even as I have learned what helps me spend more of my time enjoying and appreciating my life. I am not defined by my shorter or longer periods of mental ill health, but it has shaped the person I am. I am proud of that person, and I want others who struggle with anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation to know they should be proud too of the achievement of living with that, of picking themselves up, of overcoming unbearable feelings. For me now, success is not something external, awards or promotions or any other social validation, but the sense that I'm spending more and more of my time content and glad to be here. Well, uh, it was a very uh, last minute decision, to be honest with you, in that uh, I had finished my A-levels and was actually wondering what to do. And uh, I've got an older sister who was a dentist and um, having looked through some of her books and seen some gory pictures of people taking out teeth, I thought, well, actually, maybe that's something I could do. And so it was actually only in my uh, year off that I decided to, to actually do dentistry. Fine, I actually applied for uh, a place in various different dental schools, Liverpool, Leeds and so on, and got offers from those and actually was set to go to Leeds. But um, I was a little bit homesick, to be honest with you, and I ended up uh, wanting to come back down into London. And so I actually applied uh, to the London Hospital School of Medicine and Dentistry, or School of Dentistry as it was then, um, came be then became Barts in the London and part of Queen Mary subsequently. I had to reset my A-levels, um, and that was why I had to take a year off, really, because I got rubbish grades um, and had to reset two of my three A-levels. Um, so that was the main challenge, I guess, was getting the sufficient um, grades to get into a dental degree anywhere, really. I really enjoyed doing, I really enjoyed it. It was a real challenge for me, um, sitting in lectures and learning all of this stuff, this information, and I know a lot of peop other people struggle with that. Uh, it was much, much later on that I discovered I was dyslexic and then explained quite a lot of the reasons for why I was um, struggling to take, take in much really from, from lectures and would spend a lot of time writing and reading more broadly, which is something I'd, I'd always kind of done even in my A-level time was actually, I found it easier rather than looking at lectures, to be honest with you, to, to read books. And um, that's really how I ended up learning stuff, um, not by learning lectures. In those days, of course, we didn't have video recorded lectures, so there was nothing to go back and review. So if I didn't capture something in the lecture there and then, that was it, it was gone and I couldn't watch listen and write at the same time it was impossible so I, to be honest with you I just used to sit and listen ask questions and hope that I would learn something that way but uh, I had to go away then and because I had no notes to speak of I had to go away and read books and I enjoyed that to be honest I enjoyed that I only discovered kind of in my 40s that I was dyslexic when I was doing my PhD um, and I was very very slow and not reading enough literature in my a supervisor at the time actually said, Dominic, you're just not reading enough. Yeah. And uh, it was, I was actually supervised, I actually had a student that I was supervising as a, an MSc student um, who was struggling with dyslexia. Yeah. And I just suddenly clicked that actually, I was sharing a lot of the difficulties that she was facing. Yeah. Um, so I got a test and then diagnosed with dyslexia. Yeah. 
Well, I always struggled uh, to do well academically in school. And I think coming from a family of pretty high achievers, I've got three siblings, um, all of whom, whom got straight A's at A-level, for example. Um, I failed my A-levels and didn't, I did okay in my GCSEs, but not with an awful lot of help <laughs> from my parents, to be honest with you. Um, and a lot of it was kind of coursework stuff, which I, actually I was quite good at doing. I could do coursework because I could spend as much time as I needed on it, um, doing it. And, and many years later, when I did my MSc, the, mm. I did an MSc at Oxford, and the reason, one of the reasons I chose it was because you did coursework and you didn't have to sit down and do exams and things because those were always a nightmare for me. Um, and I vowed after I graduated that I would never sit another exam, and I never have. I never did very well in exams, but I always passed at, at university. And I think that was because I had done the broader reading and I kind of understood stuff. And, as, and I, I, as a dyslexic, and I recognize this a lot of the time when I'm speaking with students who are dyslexic, that in order to be able to do anything, to un, we have to understand it, right? And you have to spend that time reading and going into depth. And it, is, it does take longer, but in the end, you understand it. And I was, I loved doing the clinical stuff. I loved doing the hands-on practical stuff. And I was good at doing it. And so I think there was that sense of, well, it's okay. I've got a sense of doing the dentistry okay here. Nobody's telling me I'm doing bad dentistry as a, as a student. So actually, even if I'm just passing exams, I don't actually mind. I, I, I think, so I think, I'm, I think if I'd failed things, that might've been different perhaps, but because I was just scraping, I'd always only ever scrape through exams. So it was okay, you know, it was getting 55% was fine for me or 52%, you know, it was passing an exam. So um, as long as I was felt um, competent as a clinician and as a clinical person, then, then I was okay with it. I was happy with that. Well, I was very lucky. I mean, I, 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 I had a brother-in-law who, who owned a practice and he actually invited me to, to go and work with him. But I think probably because um, my mental health was struggling, I'd found it started to really struggle with my mental health, particularly in the sort of fourth and fifth year of dental school. And one of the things that we had to do back in those days, it wasn't quite so organized as it is now, is to apply for foundation, what was called vocational training, now foundation training. Um, and you actually had to apply to individual practices and so on. And I was in such a low place, I just couldn't summon the energy to do it, to be honest. And so actually I was given a kind of a lifeline out of having to do that. I was very lucky um, that my brother-in-law said, well, why don't you just come and work with me privately? And, and um, you know, you can do that. You could do that in those days. I don't know if you can now. Um, but, and so I worked in that practice for three years, but I, very early on, I discovered, you know, it's a real challenge to have to manage private patients um, as a brand new dentist. And I wasn't very competent, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I, you know, I was a safe beginner, but I wasn't, certainly wasn't, uh, had, didn't have a huge amount of experience in a lot of things. So it was quite stressful. And um, fairly early on, I had a couple of complaints. Well, I had a complaint um, made against me, which I didn't, I didn't handle well. Um, and we didn't handle well as practice, I don't think. And it ended up going to the General Dental Council. And that was extremely stressful and really challenged uh, my sense of being a competent dentist, which, as I said earlier on, that was always the sort of thing that kind of kept me going, was that sense of being, it's okay, I'm an okay dentist. Um, but it was quite difficult. And it took a whole year, I mean, the General Dental Council process, I don't know if it's quicker now, but it took a whole year for that to be kicked out and essentially for, for there to be no case to answer. And then I had another one, <laughs> just as that one um, took off, where again, that ultimately was kicked out and there was no, no major issue around it. Um, but again, it took another whole year to do it. So in both of those, my, my mental health was really, really deteriorating. Um, even though actually my clinical skills were improving, I was doing a lot of training, a lot of courses, really enjoying doing the dentistry, um, enjoying treating patients. But my sense of self-esteem was rapidly dropping. Of course, at that time, I didn't realize I was depressed. I didn't realize I had severe anxiety, but it, and, and in terms of how I saw myself, I think I just thought I was becoming useless, right? And, and, and was not a competent dentist. Um, that's ultimately where I was going. Um, and I guess ultimately, what was the point of being here, which was what then led to a 
suicide attempt after three years of, of graduating. So, yeah. I don't think I was, to be honest with you. I'm not sure I, 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 I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I, total ignorance, right? I think now, um, hopefully through you know, stuff that seems to be coming much more clear about what the signs and symptoms essentially of, of anxiety and, and poor mental health are. But I, had, I didn't know, I just assumed it was kind of almost, I don't know, I don't know what I assumed to be honest with you, but I didn't realise I had a mental health problem, right? It's bizarre now to think about it in that way, uh, that I wouldn't, but I had so, I guess it was so, such a lack of self-knowledge, of self-knowing, maybe also having tried to explore it as a younger person. I remember as a student trying to speak to um, people about not feeling um, like I should be alive and, and that sort of stuff and that kind of thing just being brushed off. And so perhaps actually I, I just came not to appreciate that those feelings were valid or, or that I should be even thinking about those or something, I don't know. I think bizarre n not to realise, I think now, bizarre to not realise that I had a mental health issue only because of my perspective now because I'm so much you know I know what, what it means when I'm starting to spiral down and, and feel depressed or very anxious um, but I, I just had no idea that that's what I was I did, didn't realize I was depressed it was crazy to think about it and there were a couple of things that really stood out one was that I had gone over to Copenhagen actually as part of a, an Erasmus exchange for three months in my final year so that was from sort of September to Christmas and I came back from that and I found it so depressing and so miserable to come back into uh, the clinical environment. And it, you know, I'd always enjoyed the clinic and I'd really enjoyed my time over in um, Copenhagen. Um, but I found it really depressing and so I actually just had to not go into clinic for a month um, because I was in such a bad sort of place. I wasn't really getting out of bed or, or anything at that time. And even prior to that, alcohol had become a really big part of my life. I mean, I think it was for a lot of us as dental students, to be fair, and probably a lot of my medical student colleagues as well. Um, and so I think I was drinking quite a lot um, by, by then. Um, and then the other thing was, the other sort of standout thing that really sort of knocked me down in that final year, and it was probably in the spring or so on, so before finals, um, was, taking a, a, an impression, a dental impression of uh, somebody's teeth and showing it to a tutor I respected and that tutor saying to me, Dominic, have you considered another career? Because he looked at the impression and clearly it wasn't very good, I can't remember. Um, and I just remember coming back from that and I was probably so reactive and vulnerable at that stage that that just made me want to give up. That last, you know, so close to, to completing and graduating, I guess I was just already not very well and you know, that kind of statement uh, undermined my sense again of being a competent um, practitioner and clinician. I remember saying to my girlfriend at the time, I, I, I think I'm gonna have to pull out the course and she of course chivied me on and thank goodness for that. But um, it's, yeah, it was real, really devastating. <laughs> it's such a simple thing. And I think now I'm so conscious of that because as student support, uh, in supporting students, um, I do hear quite a lot of the time that students really struggle with that, um, those sorts of comments, and they may seem throwaway to, a, to a, somebody in a position of power but, or, or authority, but actually they can have devastating effect on people depending on where they are at that particular moment, and I guess we just need to be a bit more sensitive about where people might be. I think one of the things about suffering from mental health difficulties is you kind of do get up and keep on going a lot of the time, right? And that's how, you know, you manage. And there's a lot of putting on a face, pretend, pretending you're okay and you're well. And, you know, even out in practice, you know, there's a lot of smiling and having to be, you know, because you're always patient focused and, you know, patient facing and really needing to be looking like, a, you know, you're okay and all that kind of stuff, whatever's going on inside. And so I think you learn to do that. And I'm sure many others do as well um, who are struggling because you kind of got to keep on going. <laughs> I think I managed until um, three years into graduating, after graduating, and I just couldn't carry on. And that was when I then decided I wanted to end my life and had had a lot of suicidal ideation by that stage um, prior to it. And I think 
So what I come to understand now about suicidal ideation is it's a kind of an easy escape from uh, really difficult emotion, uh, being in a really difficult emotional place. And so the, the suicide is thought is just a quick, a quick way out. It'll sort out all my problems. And so even just having that thought, and I know a lot of people have it, there's a lot more suicidal ideation than there is suicide, obviously. And so it's, um, it's, it's a way of kind of almost just blanking off the, the really hard feelings, um, difficult feelings you're facing. So I could keep on going, but eventually I, I decided to take my life because it was just too much at that stage. Hopeless, I would say. I'd say I was pretty hopeless that anything would change, and I think that's a very recognisable sort of feature of being there. Um, that I couldn't be a good person, I guess, or a good dentist. I think I identified too closely with my dentistry. I thought I was a dentist and that was it, and, and too much of me was invested in that. And so when then there were complaints made against me, these two complaints, and that challenged that sense of being a good dentist. Well, that was me not being a good person anymore. And I, that, that's something that over time I've managed to disentangle um, so that you can still be a good person, even if somebody's telling you you're not. Um, and that's, that's a really important point for me, I guess, learning. It's quite interesting talking to people now about that place where people were saying, but couldn't you do, couldn't you think in such, or couldn't you put, do such and such at that moment? So I will know in that moment, it, the, the feelings are so unbearable, they're so overwhelming that there's no logic, there's no rationality around it. It's just that you want to get out of it. Or I wanted to get out of that place. And so that's hopelessness. Since then, because I have had suicidal thoughts and plans um, in the 20 years since then, um, really important, my, my wife now, formerly my girlfriend um, at the time, you know, just really appreciating how important what I do is to her as well, and, and realizing that what I do has consequences for others beyond just myself. I'm not sure in the moment of wanting to take my life, I would necessarily be thinking that way, to be frank with you, because I think it is a very self-centered or self-centric way, and, and the rest of the world just gets left out of there. But I think over time, I, I've kind of just become much more aware of, of how much difficulty I would cause so many other people if I was ever to take my life and so I guess those help to sort of modulate or moderate the the sort of suicidal ideation. Very very slowly um, not in any sort of systematic or structured way and I think that's the way it is. Um, I've spent a lot of time speaking to therapists and um, sort of exploring things but a lot really has come from reading books I like reading books about stuff it helps me to understand things and so I've read a lot of books around mental health and so on and I think there was something that a therapist very early on said to me and it's a guy I saw for many many years and he said well you may you probably never get rid of depression and anxiety but all you what you can hope to do is to sort of um, be aware of when you're sort of dipping and try and learn to be able to stop it going quite so deep or to allow it to come back up again a bit quicker. And that's the aim, not to say, right, I'm never gonna be depressed again or I'm never gonna be anxious again or I'm never gonna have suicidal thoughts again, but that when you do have them, you kind of recognize them and then are able to put into place mechanisms to bring you back up out of it. But you can't do it in the, it's kind of training and I guess in the, in the period before. I don't think there's any single way in which um, one becomes more aware. I, I think those therapy sessions helped me recognize what unhelpful thoughts were, not unhelpful behaviors were, and you know, things like drinking alcohol and feeling, get, drinking far too much alcohol and getting very depressed afterwards was not a good thing, even though I did it for years and years and years. Um, but that only, you know, that only changed five years ago um, so it takes a long time before um, before coming there and it's an ongoing it's an ongoing learning I guess um, I do, do do mindfulness meditation now I think that's been very very helpful in just being aware um, 
doesn't necessarily always prevent negative thoughts and suicidal thoughts and those sorts of things, but it helps me be a much more aware of that I'm having a thought <laughs> or that I'm feeling a certain way and that maybe I'm feeling a certain way because I've had a certain thought or whatever it is. Um, I guess growing up in a culture where you don't, back then we don't talk about mental health and it's not sort of something you do, I don't know. It's growing up thinking you have to be more of a man or something. I mean, I remember being told by uh, somebody at school, you know, don't cry when you hurt, fall over and hurt your leg. You know, that's not what professional footballers do or something like that, you know, and it's kind of, an acute, you know, sort of like when I was probably seven, six, seven, eight, I don't know, you know, and I think it's an accumulation of that kind of thing. You're saying, well, don't cry, don't um, be upset. And I don't know. I don't know, just not, not an openness to, to accepting that it's okay to be unwell or to, to feel down and to feel mentally unwell and to have anxieties and things. It's okay and to have those and to talk about them and that you're not a weak person. I think that's probably the overall thing was a sense that it's weak to cry as a, as a boy, certainly, and um, carrying that through into adulthood, I suppose. Being a dentist as of being a medic or many other sort of stressy jobs um, is inherently stressful because it involves people apart from anything. But I think um, in that lies a whole sort of judgment that's going on or a perception of being judged as, as, a, as a clinician. And you can't, can't hide away from anything. And so me as a dentist and my perception of a dentist, I think, was too closely linked to my mental health, if you like. And, and it, it, I think that um, in my younger years, I would say, I was too influenced by how others thought about me. And whether that's patients thinking I was competent or incompetent, or me perceiving they thought I was competent or incompetent, or whether it was a, a tutor thinking I was, or a colleague or whatever, I think Whilst it is important to be competent, of course, and it's important to be reflective and, and open to other people's criticisms or, and comments on, on your clinical activity or whatever it is you're doing, that it, that be dealt with in a, in a proportionate way and, and not immediately to kind of catastrophize, which is something that I have done an awful lot of throughout my life, where a small criticism about something I've done suddenly becomes this terrible big thing about me being a terrible clinician or dentist and then because I associated so closely with being a dentist mm. that meant I was a terrible person and and, and that and incompetent and, and all those kind of things so it was an unhealthy relationship I would say between being a dentist and, and my mental health um, I don't think that's because dentistry caused me to have a mental health problems I really enjoyed doing dentistry and enjoyed doing dentistry it was my perception of that and it was just, it was all in here it wasn't anybody else's fault even the tutor who told me should you you know have another career I mean f frankly it's still it's still how I was receiving that message not um, necessarily that he was saying something terrible um, and like likewise with the, with the patients who made complaints I mean in both cases they were thrown out there was nothing to defend it was just people upset something and making a complaint right didn't mean I was a bad dentist and that was upheld by the GDC and so on right so so there's, a, there's an unhealthy link between dent anything to do with judging me as a dentist or a dental student and my mental well-being um, and I it's easier said than done but somehow putting a healthy barrier between those two is probably not a bad thing to to work on I can see colleagues, for example, who are really struggling from an academic perspective as well. I mean, that's the other side of this. I moved out of general practice into academia. And I think academics see themselves, in, and, and I was like that. It was like, I've got to become a professor or whatever it is to be any good, and, and linking that too much to me as an individual. And I'm a nobody if I, if I, don't, if I don't get there kind of thing, right? And I, and I think uh, I see a lot of colleagues around me who are on the... You know, looking at it, seems to be going down that route where 
their internal value is determined by this external validation by being called a professor or whatever it is that they, they want to get to. Um, and I think that really negatively affects people's mental health. Um, of course, it's good to want to develop and all those kind of things. It's not to say that those aren't good, but, it, but if you're worth, you, you know, if my, if my value and, and other people's value as an individual is determined by whether or not other people think you're good enough to be a professor or good enough to be a consultant or whatever it is, then it, it, that's kind of problematic from, from the personal perspective. What I must say is that having started to talk more about my own mental health probably about five, six years ago, and, and also my dyslexia and so on, is that I feel a lot more empowered by it, to be honest with you, and I find it actually quite liberating to be able to do it. There's certainly not the oh, um, massive discrimination or, um, I don't know, other signs of um, people kind of not thinking it appropriate or anything like that. And, that, and if anything, I found colleagues saying, yeah, I've, I've suffered from depression as well and I really struggle with that and I get severe anxiety as, as well. And, I, and, and so actually that's very rewarding then because by being open myself, other people are then open back and, and willing to talk about it. And then also with students, um, I mean, I'm very open with students. I tell students I attempted suicide three years after graduating. I mean, that's, why not? It's just part of things. And that in itself has allowed students to, you know, they come to me then and said, you know, by you saying that made me feel that it was okay to talk about me feeling really, really bad and, and suicidal. Um, so I think it's been a beneficial thing to do, to, to go through opening up and talking about it. I think I've just learned to be much more content with what I, where I am and what's around me all the time. The people that are around me, the colleagues that are around me, the students that are around me, the patients, the the nature of the world, you know, all that sort of stuff, and just really appreciate that. Um, rather than worrying about whether I'm gonna be do something or become something or whatever it is, right? And also I think, you know, it's, uh, I think psychologists will always often say, you know, we spend a lot of time regretting the past or worrying about the future, right? And not enough time in the present. And I think that is the thing that really I try to take on, of course you can't all the time, and sometimes you can't control your emotions in, in, in a strong way, but um, necessarily, but um, spending more of that, more of my time being just conscious and aware that actually there's a lot of good stuff going on around me right now. I don't need to be anywhere else. This is, this is a good place to be. Um, I think that's been really helpful. I think by opening up and being, uh, more willing to recognize that I need support. Well, A, recognizing that at times I need it, okay? Because I don't think I recognized I needed support when I was back as a dental student, for example. Um, now I have support at work. I have colleagues who are supportive because they understand, you know, they know that I've got mental health difficulties and I, they've gone through mental health difficulties as well. So there's kind of mutual support in that. Um, I even have students now, it's lovely. I mean, even students will, will offer support, you know, it's really nice, you know, you know postgraduates. Uh, and then um, my family, of course, is really supportive and, and, and great for that. And uh, I think I mean, more recently, kind of five, six years ago, I had a very severe um, dip and again was pretty suicidal and depressive and I became much more aware of actually um, other organizations like the Practitioner Health Program, uh, which is an NHS program created for doctors, dentists um, throughout the country to support them. Um, but also for dentistry, there's something called the Dentists Health Support Trust and um, I got linked into them and that was an amazing support, just checking in with me periodically, see how I was getting on, how I was doing and so on. And I think being aware of these different mechanisms has been really really helpful. I kind of have a better sense of where to go if I need to talk to somebody. Even, I mean, talking to the British Dental Association, you know, they have a uh, employment group there. I know when I was struggling with work a little while ago and, and going and talking to somebody there who supported me in, in what I was doing and so on. 
there's just a lot of stuff out there once you once you realise. I think one of the difficulty one of the difficulties for practitioners in general practice is that they're not in automatically this organisational structure that can offer support like we are as academics working at Queen Mary and, and Bart's Health a Trust, which which has also had its own sort of psychological services, particularly around the COVID um, outbreak and so on. Um, and I and I think that's quite difficult being in those isolated practices. I don't quite know what it's like for a general den general medical practitioners or medical practitioners, but for dentists, it can I imagine be quite an isolated place to be out in practice. Being conscious of the sort of I guess physical manifestations of um, poor mental health, maybe a start, realising that your lack of sleep or um, working ridiculously long hours or um, snapping at people or whatever it is might be an indicator um, that you're not feeling great. Um, if you're certainly, if you're thinking of, if they're thinking of um, suicide or, or, or just thinking rubbish about themselves and just questioning why they're here and if they're any good at doing stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, so I suppose the first thing is to recognize that and then seek some kind of outlet, some sort of support. Um, there's so many confidential services where you can talk to people. I mean, that might be talking to the Samaritans and calling them. I mean, that's totally confidential service. It's free. You can call them any time of, time, any time of day or night. Um, or uh, depending on where, where they're sort of situated, there are work sort of health programs and those sorts of things where you can call up a counsellor and just talk to somebody who's no, nobody to do with your work or anything like that. I think having that first conversation is quite hard for people um, and it, it r runs the risk uh, of opening up a whole can of worms literally for people. And I, and I say this because only because recently I've, having a student for whom things have been really difficult for a long time and then starting to sort of seek help. And I think then people can feel like they're losing control over it because it's not bottled up and, and held in a place. And so um, it, it can feel a little bit overwhelming potentially after that. But I would have that first conversation because so much can follow from it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Even just... Two months ago, I was, I gave up, I quit my job. I, I resigned from my job because I suddenly felt I was useless at doing what I was doing and, and that um, I shouldn't be doing it um, because I was in a really, really bad place. And so I resigned my job. Fortunately, I could get back in and, and, not, <laughs> and not be permanently ousted. But I think, um, I mean, I guess I have a plea almost to those people around us who, are, who don't suffer from mental health to kind of just wonder if somebody acts out of the normal and suddenly does something very rash to kind of um, be conscious that something might be going on for them and, and particularly with something like that, and the resignation was not to accept it straight off and, and to you know, explore what might be going on for somebody, right? Um, and, and see that as a potential sign of, of somebody sort of struggling. It was only very short, and, and sometimes my, dip, and my dips generally nowadays are much, much shorter than they were before, where I might be months feeling depressed. Now it's kind of a matter of days maybe or, or less. Um, and yeah, so I, I still suffer suffer, if you like, from mental health things, but as part of my life and just kind of see that as a, it's just part of me. I think the thing is that mental health is kind of, my, my mental health is very good most of the time, right? And I think this is perhaps, maybe there's perceptions out there that if, if you've been diagnosed with depression or anxiety that you're always diagnosed and always anxious, which is certainly not the case for me. Uh, most of the time I'm up here, I'm very optimistic, I'm very creative, very much looking for solutions and uh, outward going and all that kind of thing, but there'll just be dips where, um, you know, I'll suddenly go down and then come back up. Um, whether people realise that, it, I mean, I think nowadays I'm much more comfortable much more aware that I am in a good mental health perspective. I suspect people perhaps take it for granted, maybe, that they are in a, in a, in a good mental health place, but also perhaps they don't realise that maybe they're not actually where they would like to be. Um, that's not to say we can all 
be 100% all the time, right? But um, people may not be conscious that actually quite a lot of the challenges that they're facing are due to poorer mental health or, or due to anxiety and, and the stresses those that creates for them. I think a lot of it manifests in lots of different ways, doesn't it? And I mean, I'm conscious that some people it's about people get quite aggressive and it can get quite problematic as an individual. But um, a lot of people, I think, kind of withdraw and become less responsive to things, um, maybe do rash, <laughs> rash actions like me or something. Um, so I guess there's lots of different things. And I guess it's anything that maybe looks like it's a bit out of the usual for that person. Um, to recognise that. Um, I wouldn't always expect somebody to sort of open up and, and talk about it. I think people have to feel quite confident in the person they're speaking to um, that whatever they say, particularly if it's very early on and they haven't spoken to people before, that what they say will be treated confidentially. I think that's a really important part of having trust in the person you're about to, to open and, and share something with that you maybe never shared with anybody. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily expect as, as a colleague or somebody working around others that somebody would immediately open up to you and don't be offended, don't be offended by that. It's a really slow process. People take a long time to get to a place where they can talk about what the challenges that they're facing. But if they do and if somebody does open up to you, I would say be as non-judgmental as you possibly can. Spend time listening, you know, the whole active listening stuff that we teach <laughs> our undergraduates and of being there, of, uh, of, of showing that you're listening, that you're interested and all that kind of stuff. But don't come up with solutions for them. That is the worst thing you possibly can do, I think, in those situations. Listen, allow them to talk, maybe start exploring options with them if they get to that stage, but they may not to but certainly don't jump in and tell them they should do X, Y, and Z because that just disempowers and, and makes things worse, I think, a lot of the time. And I think that's something, in terms of learning, you asked me earlier on about learning, what have I learned about things? And I think, personally, that a lot of poor mental health also is associated with a feeling of disempowerment, of not being able to not being able to do whatever, right? not having the, the ability, not having the power. And so I think whenever you're trying to support people with mental health difficulties is to do what you can to empower them, to make them feel like they're the ones making decisions, they're the ones in control. Well, not make them feel like, allow them to be the person who is making um, decisions and, and being in control of their own um, life rather than suddenly taking over and becoming very paternalistic or whatever and, and helping them that way. I think everybody was pretty surprised, particularly when I first, when I attempted suicide, that was a massive surprise to a lot of people. I, I walk around with a smile on my face most of the time and I think for a lot of people it was very, it, people just didn't, even my family didn't sense that I got that far. Um, and so massive surprise, a lot of, a lot of uh, hurt for them as well. I don't mean that I, did, you know, deliberately gone out to hurt them, but a lot of sadness and, and everything around why their loved one would want to get to this stage. And I think also a sense of guilt. Um, and I think one of the things that, again, I've learned over time is how my actions create that really horrible feeling for them and, and sense of guilt particularly, um, or uh, that they haven't been good parents or siblings or whatever it is, right? And uh, that, I guess, is part of the reflective process of becoming less likely to take my life, is realizing, actually, it's, it is quite a selfish act. I don't mean that it's selfish in the same way that, I don't know, um, pre pejoratively people might use that term about others who nudge their way to the front of a, a, a queue or something like that. but. It is, a, it is a very self-centered and, and selfish in that sense um, act, and it, but it has big ramifications on other people. Um, and I don't say that, I don't feel um, bad about that as myself. I just, it's just about being aware that if I was to take my life, this is what, would have, this is what other people would have to live with the consequences of that.
I think to be less judgmental of myself on it and, and less harsh on myself. I remember saying, and I hear the same with students, and I remember saying to a therapist saying, you know, here I am, a middle class person, I've got an education, I've got family, all this kind of, it's so bad, why am I depressed? It's so bad that I'm depressed. What have I got to be depressed about, kind of thing, right? And uh, students will come on and say that to me now, and I think, you know, what you're doing in that process is layering another load of judgment on what is already a very difficult feeling. Just say, okay, this is just how I am, all right? And if it's how I am, it's how I am. You don't have to justify being depressed or having suicidal ideation. You don't have to justify that. I mean, who knows why you are, right? Why start trying to rationalize or, or do anything in that way? So I think part of accepting is just saying, that's who, who I am and that's, that's part of it. And I think there are benefits that come from it, right? There's the, the personal understanding and knowledge allows me hopefully to be a more supportive pe person to other people who have similar struggles or whatever. And, and just realizing that People are going through all sorts of struggles and maybe not mental health and so on, but maybe other, one, other struggles for whatever they are. And everybody's walking around with something probably. And I guess it's kind of just being aware of that, right? Um, so I, don't, I wouldn't take it away in, in many ways. And I think, it, yes, it, it's been painful for me, for my family and for friends, but it's, it's as it is, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's hard, and I think it's a really hard skill to learn, and I think that's another message from all of this, is that none of this is easy to, to do. It's about training. Um, and, but on that, I, I did a mindfulness meditation course um, a few years ago, and I think there's a really nice graphical demonstration of what this is. So there, we had somebody who had a back pain, and the instructor asked the person, okay, so you've got back pain, so what do you feel about that? What, is it, what, do you, what are the thoughts you have associated with that? And the, and the person said something like, oh, you know, I, I don't know, I, when I get out of bed in the morning, it's really uncomfortable or something. Um, and I feel old. So the instructor then put a load, put a, a weight on her shoulders. I can't quite remember how, what it looked like. And then she said, and what else do you sort of think? And what, what else happens around it? And said, well, I think about in the future, I may not be able to do such and such. And so she put another load on her uh, shoulder. And so by the end, this poor woman had this, these low, this, you know, multiple levels of um, weights on her. And I think that's very symbolic about how we treat ourselves when we're feeling crap to be perfectly if I hope that word doesn't matter but you know when, when you're feeling crap you feel crap don't go loading other sort of crap on top of it as I, I suppose in that this is how you are you feel bad you feel depressed you feel anxious don't start saying I shouldn't feel like this or I you know what will they think if I can't do whatever because what you're doing is just loading more negative feeling on it and I think a lot of this comes from the difficulty in society we have of accepting that people aren't always well and people aren't always doing okay and the majority, all of us are not doing okay all of the time and so um, we just need to accept that and maybe kindness is just more about acceptance and that's something another term that's used in mindfulness quite a lot is just accepting it's not saying that it's good bad or, or or anything or that you you can't try to change it but it's just this is how you are um, and don't try to put other stuff on top of it that makes you feel even worse um, so I think that's what I really mean by being kind or, or non-judgmental to yourself. And I, I think if you can sort of jettison that, those other thoughts, then you're being kinder to yourself. I think they've become much more grounded, to be honest. And again, that's another sort of term that gets used in mindfulness. But I think it's become much more about um, expecting my... expecting myself to do okay and be okay rather than to be something that I'm not or may never be or whatever. And I think actually I probably have fewer expectations if I'm honest, because I'm thinking about the future much less than I, than I used to be. Um, and so I, I guess I have an expectation that I'll carry on being okay. <laughs> and, and that's probably it rather than worrying about how I get to, to wherever and um, how I do do something differently. Um, so I guess, yeah, my expectations are probably lower and I probably think, I think about them less. And I think that's probably a healthier place for me to be 
maybe for other people it, it's, it's, it's good to have expectations because it drives them in some way. For me, it's a negative and it, it, it makes me feel rubbish about myself. So I'm much happier just to be who I am and doing what I'm doing and not have too many expectations. I think this awareness has just helped me become a better clinical teacher. Partly because I spend a lot more time being present and there for the student, for the patient, to listen, what is it that they're saying to me, rather than expecting responses or expecting people to do things. And what does this person need from me in this moment? What, how can I help this person, either as a patient or as a student, to, to learn better or to do something or whatever it is? Is this actually about skills? Is this about um, their confidence and their, and their feeling of um, being a competent clinician and so on? What, what is it that actually this person needs and how can I support them in doing that? And so I think particularly the awareness bit, the becoming much more aware and again mindfulness meditation I think is really, or might being mindful is being really helpful in, in developing this skill of being much better at listening and being there for people and responding um, to support them rather than whatever my priority is at that particular moment to get off the clinic in, in, in here as quickly as possible or to or whatever or to also become aware of also when I'm getting stressed out a little bit maybe you know if, if the if the clinic's getting very busy being aware that actually maybe my responses are being a bit curt and sharp and whatever and, and how that might play out on people so I think it's I think all of this has sort of helped a lot with that as well as of course as well as of course of having a better sense of how mental health dyslexia and other specific learning difficulties affect students um, in these environments. I think there's something to be said for developing um, assertiveness okay, and assertiveness skills and I think a lot of the students and I, I interact with who are struggling emotionally with stuff are also struggling to be assertive. Well I think a lot of people feel disempowered by stuff, people don't feel they can assert their right their need to be treated respectfully or to have to be taught something or to uh, yeah to be treated in a, in a in a way that is befitting to them as an, an, an individual and I think developing the ability and the, uh, the willingness to say hang on a moment I don't need to be treated like that I'd prefer it if you spoke to me in this way or whatever it is, so that you, people start to assert themselves. And I think that empowerment would really help a lot of people who feel quite disempowered and therefore quite anxious and, and depressed. Um, so I think that is something I've certainly developed a lot more. I was a very shy child. I was very uh, afraid of stuff, right? Uh, homesick and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think I would never have challenged people or, or I don't mean, I mean challenge sounds too much. Now I would say it's just about being um, assertive. I wouldn't assert uh, my right to be where I am and doing what I am doing. And I think that's a really important thing for people to sort of learn. Small safe experiments. It was something that a therapist taught me years ago was to practice in a, in a small way, in, in a sort of relatively safe sort of way. So don't, don't do it with the most important person in your university or something like that as your first off, right? But there might just be ways of asserting yourselves in the home, say, or in, in the clinic with your working, you know, with your colleagues, your peers that you're working with, just to say, really appreciate it if you were on time or something like that. You know, if somebody's not turning up to clinics, and we have this with the dental undergraduates where they pair up. And so one is a dentist and one is a nurse. And if the dentist is, the dentist, dental student is there and the nurse student's not there, then it kind of delays stuff and all that kind of thing. And so just saying to that person, I need to start with the patient at 9.30. I really need you to be here 15 minutes before that is an assertive phrase. Now, I think it's just learning to practice those sorts of relatively low risk um, assertive phrases. And it's about saying, I need, and it's, I need you to do X. Um, it's not about saying you're a bad person for doing something. It's about saying I need you to support me with this little bit of teaching that I'm doing. Or if, you know, if, if, the, if you're doing clinical skills or something like that and, and you don't feel like the teacher's kind of 
got it. It's like, I need you to show me a little bit more how I need to do so and so, rather than just saying, oh, the teachers just wandered past and, and not taught me and whatever. So practice in those small ways. And then over time, I think the confidence to say these things and rehearse these things in front of other people will hopefully come. I think if you're in a place where you're struggling and you, you have a sense that you're struggling, I would ask what is going to enable you to make that first step of seeking help and probably talking to somebody openly about how you are feeling. Another question I'd have, how are you going to assert your right to be here next time you feel like somebody is trampling down or disregarding you. So how will you build acceptance of the reality that you're likely to struggle with mental health for a very long time? Thank you for watching this Meaningful Conversations episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to see more videos in this series, then please like and subscribe to this channel and hit the bell so you can get notified of new videos as they're posted. We look forward to seeing you in the next one.